want to give a quick disclaimer that the following presentation is meant for educational purposes only and does not constitute any legal advice or counsel. And this is because your situation may be unique and require careful attention. Um, we're kind of going over IHS's basics today. And so as such, it's not really a one size fits all. And also we do try our best uh, to keep everything up to date with our PowerPoint presentations. And in this moment, everything is up to date. But as you know, laws and policies are constantly evolving and changing. So what might be current right now may not be so in the next few months. So if you do revisit this presentation in the next few months, just keep that in mind. All right. So the topics for today, um, we are going to go over what is IHSS, just give you an overview on what it is, um, who it applies to, the eligibility, um, the types of services that IHSS provides, um, the application process, and the appeals process if your hours are denied or terminated or um, just altered in some way. All right, so what is IHSS? Um, as many of you know, um, IHSS stands for In-Home Supportive Services. IHSS is a Medi-Cal program for people, including children with disabilities, that enable them to remain safely in their homes. So this is an alternative to an out-of-home placement. IHSS provides basic services to individuals who cannot safely perform the tasks themselves or need prompting. So IHSS is administered by each county under the discretion of the California Department of Social Services. And in a few slides later, we will be able to provide you the link to um, the county, the website that provides all the different counties um, and their own unique websites with regards to IHSS. Next slide. Okay, so who is eligible for IHSS? Any California resident is eligible for IHSS if they are blind, disabled, which includes children with disabilities, or 65 years of age or older. Um, they are also have um, they also are SSI or Medi-Cal eligible, so they have that eligibility. They are living in a home or apartment, which does not include a hospital, nursing home, assisted living, or licensed care facility and they cannot live safely at home without assistance. So this raises a question, what is a home in the context of IHSS? So if we go to the next slide, please. Great, so what is a home? We often think of you know, a typical two bedroom, single family household, um, but that isn't really the case for most people. Alternative living situations are allowed for purposes of IHSS. And this can include RVs, shelters, and also emergency extraordinary circumstances. Um, you know, in California, we get a lot of wildfires, um, flooding, that, that's been kind of recent. And so oftentimes people have to go into emergency living situations, and that's where IHSS can also apply. And that link on the slide is an all-county letter that provides context on what is considered to be home, a home as it pertains to IHSS eligibility. And this clarification is intended to assist counties in determining if an applicant or recipient of IHSS meets or will continue to meet the eligibility criteria for IHSS when residing in or moving to an alternative living arrangement. So that link will be especially helpful if you think that might pertain to you, if you're in between housing or have a very unique living situation. Next slide, great. So what kind of services does IHSS pay for? Um, it pays for a lot of services and we're gonna go over each of these in detail, um, but IHSS typically covers domestic services, related services, personal care services, accompaniment to medical appointments, paramedical services, time limited services, and protective supervision. So with the first one, domestic services, um, if we can go to the next slide, please. Great. So what are domestic services? These are general household chores to maintain the cleanliness of the home or space. So anything that you could think of as a chore, um, sweeping, vacuuming, washing and waxing of floor surfaces, washing the kitchen counters and sinks, cleaning the bathroom, storing food and supplies, taking out garbage, dusting and picking up, 
um, cleaning over and under the stove, cleaning and defrosting the refrigerator or you know kitchen appliances, um, bringing in fuel or heating for cooking purposes from a fuel bin in the yard, um, changing bed linen. Uh, so it's pretty vast. This isn't this isn't all exhaustive. Um, and I do want to note that when there is a specific service that is identified and documented by a county social worker as necessary for the person to remain safely at home, then it may be obtained as a domestic service. So for example, if you have a wheelchair, that could include wheelchair cleaning as a domestic service or changing and recharging the wheelchair batteries. And next we have related services. And related services are often grouped with domestic services, but they are separate and distinct services. And we'll go through, through each one of these with examples because it can be kind of confusing. So the first related service we have is meal prep and meal cleanup. So meal prep is defined as planning menus, preparing foods, cooking, and serving meals, anything that you could think of in the preparation of the meal, so before you eat. Um, Cleanup is defined as cleaning up the cooking area and washing, drying, and putting away cookware, dishes, utensils, or loading and or unloading a dishwasher. But meal cleanup would not include the general cleaning of the fridge or the stove or the cup oven or countertop. Those would be considered domestic services. So that's where it can kind of get confusing. But just kind of think group one as cleaning services and the other one as services related to the meal, specifically for the meal. So what you would do directly before and directly after the meal, that is typically under related services. So next we have laundry, and that includes the washing, drying, folding, and putting away of clothes and household linens. Um, grocery shopping, that doesn't just include the shopping itself. It also includes the making of a grocery list, traveling to and from the store, shopping, loading, unloading, and storing the food purchased in your cabinets, pantries, fridge, um, and then also other shopping and errands, which can include picking up prescriptions, buying clothes, toiletries, reading important documents such as medication instructions, food labels, utility bills, or rental agreements. So it's pretty extensive. If we go to the next slide, great. So next we have personal care services or non-medical care services. So with feeding, this is typically known as assisting someone with eating meals, which can include cleaning his or her face and hands before and after meals. With bathing, grooming, and oral hygiene, that can be assisting a person with bathing or showering, um, shampooing, drying, brushing hair, shaving, brushing teeth, anything that you would kind of think of as what would go on with like grooming and your personal hygiene. Um, I do wanna note that some may have seen routine bed bath as a service. Um, that is giving a person who is confined to a bed a routine sponge bath. So next we have bowel and bladder care, and that assists the IHSS recipients um, with using the toilet. So getting on and off, um, using a bedpan um, or urinal, emptying and cleaning an enema or a catheter, applying diapers, disposable undergarments, uh, wiping and cleaning the person, as well as washing and drying the recipient's hands. And then we have dressing, which is really assisting the IHSS recipient to put on and take off their clothes as necessary throughout the day. Transfer, uh, which can be kind of confusing, but it's essentially getting in and out of bed, on and off seats, et cetera. So that doesn't just include the bed, but a chair, a couch, a wheelchair, a walker, or other assistive device. And it's usually occurring within the same room. However, transfer does not include assistance on and off the toilet because that would be bowel and bladder care. Um, and changing the position of a person to pr promote circulation and to prevent skin breaking down, that would be considered repositioning, not transfer. And I know this is quite thorough and I don't, I wouldn't expect anyone, not even myself to have all this memorized. So you will be provided with these resources. Um, and I also do encourage you to look up the manuals on policies and procedures with regards to IHSS. We will have the link on this PowerPoint and that kind of just 
goes through everything so much more thoroughly. Um, and it's a really great reference. So we do have oral hygiene and then ambulation, which is um, defined as assisting a person with walking or moving around the home, which includes to and from the bathroom, from the home to the car and vice versa, and into and out of the car for transporting to medical appointments or alternative resources. Um, we next have help with prosthesis, which is leg braces, visual and hearing aids, artificial limbs. So that can be considered taking off or putting on the prosthetic devices. Um, and then we have help with medications, which is defined as reminding the recipient to take prescribed or over-the-counter medications and setting up medication organizers. And we do have other personal services that are not listed there. I did mention repositioning, which is rubbing skin to promote circulation um, and or prevent skin breakdown, um, turning in the bed and other types of repositioning, supervising those exercises. Uh, menstrual care is also a very important other personal care service uh, and respiration assistance because there are some IHSS recipients who do need assistance with non-medical breathing related services such as self-administration of oxygen and cleaning breathing machines. All right, so next we're going to go into time-limited services. And time-limited services are unique because they are not continuously provided throughout the year. They're usually kind of a one-time thing. So first we have heavy cleaning. And heavy cleaning is a thorough cleaning of the home to remove hazardous debris or dirt. It's authorized one time only and only under very certain circumstances. So examples of when authorized may be when you are first granted IHSS, when you stop receiving IHSS or ineligible for a year and then start receiving IHSS again, uh, when living conditions result in a threat to someone's safety, to the IHSS recipient's safety, or where a person is at risk of eviction for failure to prepare home for fumigation. So that's when heavy cleaning, those circumstances when heavy cleaning can be warranted. Uh, there's also removing yard hazards, which is also known as yard hazard abatement. And so this can include weed, weeds, or high grass. So light work in the yard to remove high grass, weeds, and trash when those materials pose a fire hazard. hazard. And that's, again, um, authorized one time only. Or shoveling ice or snow, which can be removing the ice, snow, or other hazardous substances from entrances and essential walkways when these materials make access to the home hazardous. Um, and finally, we have teaching and demonstration. And teaching and demonstration refers to teaching and demonstrating those services provided by IHSS providers so the recipient can perform services which are currently performed by IHSS providers by themselves. So certain limitations do apply here. Um, and not all services are uh, eligible. It's typically limited to housework, meal prep, meal cleanup, laundry, bathing, feeding, dressing, and yard work. And it is also a three-month maximum. All right. So now we are going to pivot a little and talk about protective supervision, which is a service within IHSS uh, that allows a person to be supervised and safeguarded from injury, hazards, or harm. So it's essentially 24 hours a day due to dangers posed by the person's behavior. So a person is entitled to protective supervision if the following is demonstrated. So first, if the person has a mental impairment, or mental illness, and the person is non-self-directing due to the mental impairment or disability. And what does non-self-directing mean? I just kind of want to go through with that because it can be also kind of confusing. So non-self-directing means there's an inability to assess or appreciate dangers or risks of harm caused by certain behaviors. So there is no awareness of dangers that can result from one's behavior. So this is generally evaluated by considering three elements, memory, orientation, and judgment. And with memory, um, you know, that's basically recalling learned behaviors and information from the distant past as well as the recent past. Orientation is having an awareness of time, place, self, and other people in one's environment. Judgment 
is making decisions as to not put oneself in danger. So often protective supervision is really warranted for people who kind of don't have that stranger danger awareness. That's just one example. So that's what person uh, non-self-directing means. You kind of take into account uh, memory, orientation, and judgment of the recipient. So the person has a mental impairment, uh, they are non-self-directing, and the person requires 24-hour supervision to safeguard against self-injury, hazard, or accident. And the person, and it's also for children under 18 years of age. And so I just kind of want to go back to that third element where they require 24-hour supervision. This means that the behaviors that creates risks of harm are frequent and unpredictable, which require constant supervision. So I'll give a quick example here. Let's say a child only touches a hot stove when the parent is cooking. That's considered predictable behavior because you know during the time when the child will touch on the stove, touch the stove. It's a specific circumstance. It's a specific situation, usually when, you know, mom or dad is cooking dinner or lunch or whatever. Um, and that's the only time they'll touch the hot stove. Perhaps they don't even know how to turn on the stove. So that's predictable behavior. So that would not warrant protective supervision. However, let's say if the child does know how to turn on the stove, so the child frequently and randomly turns on the stove in order to touch it when it's hot. And that could be done at any time of the day. Um, it's quite sporadic. You don't know when it's going to happen. That would require 24-hour supervision. And so the standard for children below 18 years of age, the minor must need more supervision than a child of the same age without a mental impairment or disability. So, uh, you know, comparing it to a neurotypical, comparing the child with a disability to a child uh, that is considered neurotypical. And that's because, you know, at certain ages, you know, a lot of four-year-olds and five-year-olds don't really have that stranger danger awareness. Um, they might not be self-directing, and that's not really due to their disability. That's just due to their age. Um, so it's important to consider the nature, frequency, and duration of the interventions required. So let's say a parent may let a neurotypical child play in a different room for an extended period of time, but a parent of a non-self-directing neurotypical child cannot do this since the child can harm themselves. So it's really a case-by-case -case basis, and it's important to kind of think about all the circumstances surrounding the child and whether supervision is in need there. All right, so let's talk about the types of behaviors that warrant a need for protective supervision. We have wandering from the home and getting lost, eating non-food items, wandering into the street without checking for cars, attempting tasks beyond their physical and or mental capability and not understanding the risk of injury. So that can be trying to move furniture or heavy objects, climbing onto the counters, climbing tall furniture and jumping off. Those are all examples where it's beyond their physical or mental capabilities and them not understanding the risks. Uh, turning on the stove and forgetting to turn it off, self-biting or scratching, lack of stranger danger awareness. And at the bottom, you'll find the link provided by the Department of Social Services. It is uh, the SOC 821 form, and this is an assessment of need for protective supervision. And it must be filled out by an attending physician uh, or medical professional, and they will check appropriate boxes regarding deficits in memory, orientation, and judgment of the recipient. All right, so those are the type of behaviors that warrant a need for protective supervision. When is protective supervision not available? So protective supervision will not be available for friendly visiting or social activities. Um, when the need is caused by a medical condition and the form of supervision required is medical. So for example, if the recipient has diabetes and needs supervision in case they become hypoglycemic. So remember when we spoke about protective supervision, it's for 24 hours a day and it's for the person's safety. We're thinking, you know, unpredictable behaviors, um, infrequencies. We don't know when it's going to occur. Those are the types of things when we think of protective supervision. Whereas for things like a medical condition or here in anticipation of a medical emergency, if you know the recipient has a congestive heart failure and is in anticipation of a heart attack, those are kind of predictable and it's kind of for a different service. Um, so we have 
you know, medical conditions in anticipation of a medical emergency to prevent or control antisocial or aggressive behavior. So for example, getting into fights or destroying property, protective supervision will not be available in that instance. And also to guard against deliberate self-destructive behavior. So when an individual knowingly intends to harm themselves. And again, you know, with protective supervision, often the recipient is not really aware of their surroundings or of their actions, or they don't understand the risks of their actions. Uh, there are typically deficits in memory and orientation and judgment. So those kind of are a bit, are contrasting these instances. And um, if you would like to learn more about it, we do have the Manual of Policies and Procedures, and it provides program service categories and time guidelines with regards uh, to protective supervision. All right, so we spoke about IHSS. We spoke about protective supervision, uh, which is a service of IHSS, and it's for 24 hours a day. Now we are going to talk about paramedical services. And so paramedical uh, services are a different category of services also available under the IHSS program. So paramedical services are prescribed by a doctor for a person's health and require some training and judgment to perform. So IHSS include those necessary paramedical services that are ordered by a licensed healthcare professional who is lawfully authorized to do so, which individuals could provide for themselves, but for their functional limitations. So because of their disability. And we have the DRC publication uh, right over on this link. And it is really, it covers everything you need to, about, need to know about IHSS. It's widely used among advocates and attorneys at DRC, and it's a really helpful resource. If you just want to know everything. And we'll talk more about it in the next few slides as well. Um, so paramedical services will not be provided unless they are, um, oh, sorry, I just skipped over something. But um, so yeah, the pro, it's a an IHSS service that is provided when the following is demonstrated. So when the person can't perform the service at all, the activity is necessary to maintain the person's health, and the service requires training and judgment to perform, such as puncturing skin, inserting a medical device into a body orifice. So this requires some kind of specialty, but it can be taught to the IHSS provider. Um, but it's kind of what you would think of under the realm of medical services. All right, good, next slide, great. So um, some examples that we have um, include administering meds or giving injections, range of motion exercises, pressure sore or wound care, catheter insertion, bowel program, enemas, tube feeding, and trach care and suctioning. So paramedical services will not be provided unless they are ordered by a licensed healthcare professional using the SOC 321 form. And the link is at the bottom there. So paramedical services must be provided at the licensed healthcare professional's direction. The licensed healthcare professional must determine the time needed to perform the service. And licensed healthcare professionals aren't just doctors. Um, it can include registered nurses, physical therapists, and or occupational therapists. And in order to receive paramedical services, a recipient must give informed consent. And here, consent means you must give permission to receive paramedical services ordered by the licensed medical professional. And the IHSS recipient also has the right to choose the licensed healthcare professional who completes the paramedical order. And I just kind of want to give an example because I know we spoke about um, non-medical help with medications, which was under personal services. So that would, you know, in the realm of administering meds or giving injections, non-medical help with medications would be reminding someone to take medication, organizing medicine, or cutting pills in half. But in this case, administering medicines or giving injections uh, in the realm of paramedical services would be putting the medication directly in someone's mouth or crushing the medication and placing it in food. So that would be a paramedical service. And at the bottom, we do have the SOC 321 form, which is a request for order and consent. Um, it's a simple two-page form that you can find through that link. 
You basically fill in your medical provider's name and information, so it can be addressed to the medical provider, who will then fill out the information. Um, and that includes answering questions such as as to whether the patient has a medical condition that results in a need for IHSS paramedical services and listing the condition. Um, it also requires the doctor to list the paramedical services needed that are to be provided by IHSS. Um, and with paramedical services, everything has to be very, very, very specific. So when the doctor lists a paramedical service, the doctor should name the type of service, the time required to perform the service each time performed, the frequency, so the number of times and the time period, and how long the service should be provided. And your, you, both the doctor and you must sign the form or the patient must give informed consent. And you would need to make arrangements for your new provider to be trained by your doctor on how to provide any paramedical services you need and the risks involved. And if you are not sure about how the services should be done, you should also ask your doctor about this. Um, really important as well, you, you and your provider should know what to do if there is an emergency while your provider is performing paramedical services. And lastly, it is really important that your IHSS provider not perform any paramedical service for you until they have received proper training by a licensed healthcare professional. Alrighty. So next, we're going to talk about children's eligibility because that there's a couple different rules with regards to minors, so those who are under the age of 18. So IHSS does take into account the needs a disabled child may have that exceed those of a child without disabilities. So similar to protective supervision, we're comparing children with disabilities to children without disabilities. So an eligible child with a disability can receive the following services, personal care services, related services, paramedical services if prescribed by a doctor, protective supervision, and assistance with travel to approved places. And I'm going to get into, you know, you might be thinking, why isn't domestic services listed? And I will get into that in the next couple of slides, but generally domestic services are not provided to minors, those who are the age under the age of 18. And that's because usually, you know, you won't have a six-year-old vacuuming. That's certain, most of those services wouldn't be a applied or, you know, generally children without disabilities wouldn't be doing those kind of services. Um, but there are exceptions that do apply, and we will get into that in the next couple slides. Alrighty. So how are hours calculated? IHSS establishes maximum monthly hours depending on whether you are considered to be severely impaired, SI, or non-severely impaired. According to IHSS regulations, whether you're non-severely impaired or severely impaired is determined by adding hours in the following categories, meal prep, meal cleanup, respiration assistance, bowel, bladder, bladder care, feeding, routine bed bath, dressing, menstrual care, ambulation, transferring, bathing, oral hygiene, grooming, rubbing skins, repositioning, help with prosthesis and paramedical services. And so you are considered to be severely impaired if you receive 20 hours or more in those categories each week. And you are considered to be non-severely impaired if you receive 19 or less hours in those categories each week. And so if we can click on the first link there where it says four programs, I'm going to just briefly discuss the four programs that are in IHSS. Um, and it's often helpful when I just kind of you visually see that chart right there. Yes, perfect, thank you so much. Um, you don't have to memorize this, but generally when you receive a notice of action that you know you have IHSS hours, usually on that notice of action, it will indicate which program you are in. And the program you are in, um, depending on which one you're in, it has a certain number of maximum hours of IHSS hours. So it's just good to know for educational purposes or Perhaps you think maybe you're in the wrong program and you want to contest it, or maybe a different program is beneficial for you. Um, so let's get into it. So the first program is the Personal Care Services Program, PCSP. And to be eligible for the Personal Care Services Program, you must be receiving full scope Medi-Cal and your IHSS provider cannot be your spouse or parent. 
And whether you are non-severely impaired or severely impaired, the maximum number of hours is 283 hours per month. The next program we have is the IHSS Plus option, IPO. And to be eligible for IPO, you do not qualify for the personal care services program because one of the following. So either your IHSS provider is your spouse or parent, you receive advanced pay, and advanced pay is an option for IHSS recipients to receive an advanced payment for their monthly services to pay their providers directly, or you receive a restaurant meal allowance. And a restaurant meal allowance is given to IHSS recipients who have adequate quick cooking facilities at home, but their disabilities prevent them from using the facilities. And with the IHSS Plus option, if you are severely impaired, the maximum number of hours you can receive is 283 hours. And if you are non-severely impaired, the maximum number of hours you can receive is 195 hours. And then the third program we have is the Community First Choice option. And to be eligible for the Community First Choice option, you must be eligible for full scope, federal financial participation, Medi-Cal, and meet a nursing facility level of care. So it is quite specific. And again, whether you are non-severely impaired or severely impaired, the maximum number of hours you can receive is 283 hours, um, but only 195 hours of those hours can be for protective supervision. And it is often suggested that if you are in the IHSS Plus option, which was the second program, um, but you can also be on the community first choice option. So if you meet a nursing facility level of care, um, you can consider switching to the community first choice option. And that's because it allows for a greater maximum of hours, um, which you would still need to prove eligibility for. And you may also benefit from the spousal impoverishment rules. And then the last program I want to talk about is the IHSS residual. And um, it's quite rare uh, to be eligible for IHSS residual. You do not receive full scope Medi-Cal or do not receive full scope Medi-Cal with federal financial participation. So this generally means IHSS residual is for lawful permanent residents. Um, so only about 1.4% of individuals receiving IHSS are under this program. It's pretty rare. Um, and if you are severely impaired, the maximum is 283 hours. And if you're non-severely impaired, the maximum is 195 hours. All righty. Um, so we can go back to the PowerPoint. So those are just the four different programs. Um, it's usually not very consequential. It's just really for more um, information purposes. So next we're going to talk about proration. So when IHSS services can be met in common among anyone in the home, the hourly need for that service should be prorated. So if multiple people benefit from the provision of a related or domestic service, then the time it takes to prepare that service is divided equally among everyone who benefits, including non-IHSS recipients in the household. So for example, if it takes a parent 100 minutes to do weekly laundry for all five members of the family, including the parent and the single IHSS beneficiary, then the amount of time allotted to the beneficiary is 20 minutes because we have 100 minutes divided by five members. And so that would be 20 minutes for that one IHSS beneficiary. And so the service uh, categories that are heavily prorated are domestic services and heavy cleaning and related services. And generally, if a service is not provided to more than one person at a time, then it should not be prorated. Um, and so next, we are going to talk about alternative resources. And alternative resources are IHSS-like services you receive through other programs, such as an adult daycare program or school. So after determining the amount of alternative resources you receive, the social worker will deduct this time from your total assessed need. So schools, adult or children daycare centers, community resource centers, senior centers are all examples of alternative resources. And so we can go over a bit of a hypothetical here. I didn't get that. Oh, Could you try again? That was my Apple Watch. Sorry, guys. Um, so let's say you live in a household with your IHSS provider and the provider cleans up after breakfast and dinner for both of you. Let's say you go to an adult daycare center where you receive assistance cleaning up for your after your lunch. So in the meal cleanup category, 
there's a column labeled services you refused or you get from others. Here, the county social worker would first add up the total amount of time spent cleaning up after breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So then the county social worker would make an adjustment or proration because the cleanup services your providers provide benefits both you and the provider. So this means the social worker assigns your prorated time to you in the column amount of service you need, and then the county social worker will indicate the cleanup assistance you receive from the alternative resource, so the daycare center. And so that information would be listed in the services you refused or you get from others column. All right, so I'm going to talk about a couple of the a couple of the resources uh, of the tools that we have. And so we have first the, um, if we can go on to the next slide. Great. So we have the IHSS Social Worker Field Assessment. Oh, I think we skipped a slide here. Okay, great. So the functional index ranking. Um, so the functional index ranking can be kind of confusing, so we're going to go over it. Um, we have the hourly task guidelines that advise the county IHSS social workers to determine functioning using rankings and then give hours based on the rankings. So we have rank one to rank six. And rank one means independent. You are able to perform the function without human assistance. So you're fully independent on rank one. And with rank six, that means there is an extraordinary need requiring full human assistance. And so step one would be determining functioning. So I just as social workers, they must determine how much help you need for each task. So they'll use the hourly task guidelines and they begin by ranking the functioning in the number of categories that we discussed. So domestic services, bowel and bladder care, um, respiration, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so they would rank one if you're fully independent, um, rank two if you're able to perform a function but needs verbal assistance, um, rank three is you can perform the function with some human assistance, um, including but not limited to direct physical assistance. Um, rank four is they can perform a function with only human assistance. Um, and rank five means they cannot perform the, the function with or without human assistance. And rank six means there is an extraordinary need requiring full assistance. And so the next step is using the hourly task guidelines to determine how much time can be authorized for each task. And those guidelines are meant to help an IHS social worker to determine how much time should be provided for each task you need help with. And exceptions to the guidelines are only allowed when necessary to enable a recipient to remain safely in their home. And exceptions really only apply to time and do not allow the addition of any tasks not already identified under the service. And so with this chart here, um, this is specifically for minors. All minors are generally assessed a functional rank of one when identified unless extraordinary need is documented. And the reason being is because domestic services are, um, aren't really considered for children. So they're considered to be fully independent. They would be a one. They wouldn't be um, viewed as needing any kind of services there. And that's because usually children without disabilities aren't expected to do those kind of services. However, as the minor gets older, there are more opportunities to be ranked higher. Um, so it could be, a, you know, as they're 16 years old, they're more likely to have chores. So they would be ranked higher, um, you know, less independence as opposed to a toddler who wouldn't be normally expected to do those kind of domestic services. And so that chart is um, just an example from the Department of Social Services, you can look over it and how that would pertain to minors. All right, if we can go into the next slide. Okay, so how do you apply for IHSS? Um, so first, you would contact your local IHSS County Welfare Office and apply. And the link over there lists the county IHSS program website. So depending on the county you're in, it may or may not be different. Um, and then you would fill out the application, which is the SOC 295. It's about eight pages um, where you would fill in your information. So personal, veteran, SSI info, past IHSS info, household info, and communication accommodations. And you would basically, again, 
Similar, fill in your information and authorize release of your healthcare information to a licensed healthcare professional. Um, the second part would be completed by your healthcare professional, which is essentially a brief questionnaire um, on whether you qualify for IHSS. So for example, is the individual unable to independently perform one or more activities of daily living? Um, and if we go to the next slide, okay. So these two, the self-assessment and the social worker home assessment are really, really important um, and can really be quite consequential as to how many hours you will receive and whether or not you will be denied. So a county social worker will interview you at your home to determine your eligibility and need for IHSS. Based on your ability to safely perform certain tasks for yourself, the social worker will assess the types of services you need and the number of hours the county will authorize for each of these services. So the purpose of the home visit is to find out what you can and cannot do for yourself, what services you need, and the time your provider needs to perform those services. Your job is to help the county IHSS worker understand all of your care and special care needs and what they mean in terms of time. So here, it is important to be honest and open. Um, do not minimize your disability problems and care needs because you may end up not getting the hours you need. And even though you may feel embarrassed, it's really best to explain things fully so the county worker understands your situation. So before the county worker arrives, have the IHSS worksheet in part two ready with the hours you think you need. Um, because remember, the county will authorize only what you really need and will not allow extra time for comfort services. And an example of a comfort service is extra dusting to make things look nice. So be prepared to explain your worksheet hours. Make a list so you will not forget anything. So what tasks you need or your provider does, how you determine the time each takes. So it's especially important if there are differences between what the county authorized before and what you believe you need now, why the state hourly task guidelines are not appropriate for your care needs, or may not apply to your situation, and what special factors need to be considered. Um, and it's also important to make a note of the time the, the person comes to the home and when they leave. And that's because these assessments should take at least one to two, even maybe three hours, depending on the situation. And there have been instances where the county worker will do everything in 30 minutes, and that's not adequate enough. Um, and so we also have the SOC 873 form, which is similar to the healthcare certification form, uh, which is two pages and you would fill in your info as well as your medical professional information um, and the self-assessment, which you can uh, read more on the disability rights publication, will help you prepare for the IHSS workers initial intake assessment or the annual review. Um, so the guide will help you represent yourself and others in fair hearings when there is a dispute about the number of hours you need. So doing that as self-assessment will really help you figure out how many hours you need and what to point out to the IHSS worker completing the assessment. All right, so lastly, we are going to talk about the appeal. So with a notice of action, what is it? Um, your IHSS social worker must send you an IHSS NOA each time a decision is made related to your eligibility for IHSS. Um, so for example, once your IHSS application has been processed, your social worker will send you an NOA. And your IHSS social worker will send you an NOA if your hours are increased, decreased, or if services are completely terminated. Um, and IHSS is also required to send you an NOA if there is some other change made to your IHSS services. So if you have applied for, have received, or are currently receiving benefits or services from an assistance program listed and you receive an NOA um, denying your ben benefits, or you turned in an application or other information and the county did not act on it, you can ask for a state hearing. And if you feel you were not awarded enough hours, you should file your request for that hearing within 90 days of the effective date listed on your NOA. Um, and if your appeal is based on a reduction of hours or a loss of benefits, you should request a hearing before the NOA's effective date and should request aid paid pending. Aid paid pending will allow you to continue receiving services while the case is being re re reviewed. 
And if you do not get an IHSS NOA or your NOA takes effect in less than 10 days from the time you get it, you should ask for a hearing and aid paid pending your hearing right away. Generally speaking, IHSS is required to send your NOA 10 days before the change in services is supposed to happen. And the reason being is that it is meant to give you time to ask for a hearing before the change is supposed to happen so that your benefits can continue at the same level. Um, if the county does not give your, uh, you advance notice of the change in your benefits, the county must reinstate your IHSS benefits retroactively. So even if you lose your appeal, you will not have to pay for any services you received while your case was being decided. And that's really important because sometimes it can take several months before your case is decided. Uh, the first page of your of the NOA will tell you when the NOA will take effect. And you can request a hearing online, by phone, by mail, or by fax. And with regards to the appeal, you do, you know, the best policy is to just kind of gather as much information as possible so um, to prepare for your hearing. So gather information about how the county IHSS worker determined the hours you were authorized. Make an appointment to go into your IHSS office to review your IHSS case file. Ask your worker for a copy of the latest needs assessment forms because those forms will include notes about why hours were or were not given. Um, you should also ask for a copy of the most recent SOC 293 form. Those forms include information on the functional ranking about what you can, cannot do. And if you are challenging a reduction, ask for copies for both of your new and your old assessment forms and your new and old SOC 293 forms. You can ask for a copy of the sheets in your file where notes were made about contacts and visits with you over the last year. Um, you can ask for the copy of the county's hourly task guidelines, as well as doctor or medical reports. Um, if IHSS reduced your hours, ask your worker for copies of the regulations listed. So it's really important to be prepared in case you want to appeal um, or go to a hearing. And in the next slide, yes, we have some resources here um, and Lonnie has placed them also in the chat. Uh, so the first one is the public, the disability rights publication on IHSS. Um, as mentioned, it is quite comprehensive. It goes over IHSS and its different programs such as protective supervision and paramedical services. Uh, the next one is the DRC intake line. If you have a unique situation or a unique question, um, or you just, you know, don't want to speak about it publicly, which is more than okay, um, feel free to call the intake line. Uh, the third link is the Department of Social Services IHSS regulations, and it also spells out the manual of policies and procedures. Um, and then the last link is the Department of Social Services website.